If you could also think about trying to make more money, I think that would be a better upside and in a shorter term rather than saving. A lot of buyers come in and they're like, I just want my payment to be X, but the house that they want is a payment of Y. A lot of first time home buyers think it's like the stock market. I'm gonna lose money today, I'm gonna lose money tomorrow. I always tell people like the core for me is like AA for business people. It really has been like that for me because guys like me, we just do really well with structure and a plan. If you show me a plan that works, I'll do it. One of the cool things about AI is it actually helps people that aren't techie learn how to do very techie things. AI is almost like a business coach too. You could put anything in there. Is it's never been easier for someone to figure out how to make more money right now. Well, I am so excited, Julie, uh, for you to make it on. I know you're a very busy lady. So this this is Julie Johnson, guys. She's a friend of mine. She's currently coaching me. Uh, Julie Johnson, for those that don't know, she is a, a mortgage lender in the Seattle area. I believe you're in Seattle, right? Okay, right in Seattle. Um, when I say a mortgage lender, like she's one of the top in the nation. Uh, she's a business coach. She's a wife. She's a mom, and I've really been enjoying getting to know her because she's also a very humble and just loving human being. So I'm so grateful. Thank you for making time out of your busy schedule to hang out today. Oh, that's so sweet, Chris. And I, too, you know, I'm so excited because you know I am coaching you this semester, and everything that I've heard about you is actually true. So, <laughs> so you're just, uh, you've got that cool, smooth voice, and you're authentic, and you're kind, you're super wickedly smart, uh, and techie and all that good stuff. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm the honored one. Well, I appreciate you saying that you're pretty techie yourself. I mean, that's, uh, one of the things we connected on, you know, the mortgage world has really changed over the last few years with, I mean, the pandemic and, you know, people doing business over zoom, but also just the amount of, people that are using social media now to make purchasing decisions. I mean, would you ever, I'm not going to ask you how long you've been in the business because I don't know if you want to answer that, but would you ever imagined 10 years ago that people would be making some of the biggest buying decisions in their life based on Instagram or Facebook? No, no way. The world is changing. And, you know, uh, to be at the top of your field, we need to adapt because change is always inevitable. But no, I never, ever thought that. I thought it was just for fun, social media. Uh, but, you know, uh, I came late into it, I guess, two and a half years ago. Was, you know, I, I started with nothing. Like you never saw my face on my Instagram or Facebook page. It was always other people to like fully committing, going all in, uh, you know, and just mostly to build my brand. But, but yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. Like never in a million years would I thought, think this would happen. Yeah. I mean, I'm like you, I, I started a little bit after you and I think you and I are in the core, you know, so we, for those that don't know, we're a part of the, the leading coaching program for mortgage lenders and realtors nationwide. And, and, you know, we've both kind of had these blinders on for years where we're just following a proven plan that still works today. Um, but I remember it was about, it was about a year and a half, maybe two years ago that I was on a coaching call and there was a few of us like you that we had a proven plan and we were kind of not paying attention to Instagram and YouTube. Not that we didn't think people were probably some people were succeeding at it. Um, but we just realized like, man, like it's at the point now where if we don't start doing this, it's going to, it's going to cost us because it really is getting so much traction in our business. So I'm with you. I went all in on it. I went to, you know, Neil Dingra's event, Ford Academy. They were such a great, uh, just a great place to start, but also a great place to still be. I, I still talk to them to this day and they, uh, it's a great group for mortgage lenders and realtors that want to figure out how to educate people online. And it, you know, it's, it's a different world these days with all these cameras and lights, but I don't know about you, but there is a creative side of me that's enjoyed it a little. <laughs> Immensely. I, I tell you, like, <clears throat> you know, I made a commitment, but I really wasn't happy about making that commitment because I didn't like videos. But I am so, so, I feel so fortunate that I jumped in because it, you know, doing this for over 25 years, the mortgage industry, which I love, I mean, I'm passionate about it. I love it. But this brought a new side to our business that was really exciting. 
So, you know, now I get look forward to, to shooting reels and to, you know, educate people online. It's like never thought that would happen, but it's actually brought more desire and passion to what I do. Totally. And, and it's, it's such a cool way to connect with people. I was telling my wife last night, I was like, the, I told her, I said, there's these four or five major things going on right now in my life, in my business. And I said, if I wouldn't have made the decision to start getting into this whole content creation world, I would have never met these incredibly powerful people. I wouldn't have connected with them. So that's been one of the funnest parts of it, Julie, is how it's a, a guy in Redding, California, which is a very small town in California. Is I don't feel like I'm in a small town anymore. It's like open the world up to me. You know what I mean? You're right. The world is just open. I mean, I'm speaking to people in different states. I get to collaborate, you know, with people like you in California and I'm here in Seattle. Like it is just crazy good and exciting. And I just, I, I know there's more to come. And so, you know, as we're, as AI is evolving, I'm excited about learning more and you have really incorporated AI into your business more. So I'm excited to learn from you too, but I'm just looking forward to the future. It's so much, much fun. It really is. And, and I think your story is a really cool one. I have a lot of different, I have a lot of like middle to upper middle class families that are trying to figure out how to buy a house or buy their third investment property that listen to our podcast, but also a lot of realtors and lenders that listen. And so one of the things that I've learned about you, Julie, is in the last six months is there's so much more than than what anyone would think, which is true about everybody, right? We we have these ideas of who they are and then we get to know them. We're like, wow, there's so much depth to their, who they are. But, you know, people that see you and don't know you, I mean, you're this, you know, v a successful lender, um, you're a business coach, you're pretty lady, you're, you're fit, you work out all the time. But when I got to know you, I've realized like you've had to fight really hard to get where you're at. And I think that's such an inspiring pe thing for people to hear stories like that. So I'd love to hear like, how did you get here today? Wow. Yeah. So goodness. Uh, I got into the industry when I was in my twenties, uh, when it was cowboy land and it wasn't, you know, it, it was a bad time to be honest. It was a little scary. They could hire any loan officer or any realtor back then. But today it's a lot different, right? Um, we have to pass a really hard test, FBI fingerprints, all that. It's it's really legit. But uh, I, I, you know, I hit the lottery getting into this industry, I tell you, because I love it so much. So it is hard. And it's, it is tough sometimes. But, you know, anything that you do that's worth something is going to be hard, you know, th for sure. But yeah, so um, I was, a, I started my career as a broker where that's like the middle person between, you know, wholesale lenders. And then um, the crash came in 2008 and it was pretty crazy and scary. Uh, my company got, which I had, my, my, which I owned uh, with my brother, we got bought out by um, a major company and bought out. I don't mean we got rich. We all had really good transition plans landed at, a, at an, another national major company. And then from there, I, I've actually only been at four companies, you know, over 25 years. So um, yeah, and, and you're right. It's like I had to fight for what I wanted. No one just told me you're going to, you know, be a branch manager. I had to say, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, and I had to ask for it. You know, like the answer is always no until you ask. So, and I'm very driven. And um, I was a single mom for a long time. And that's part of why I was so driven because I had to feed my children and I just had to set an example. And, you know, I went through a period where I was going through a divorce and I, you know, I had to move out of that house, move in with my, my parents and it was scary. And I really felt a lot of instability and that was just before I actually entered the mortgage industry. So because of that instability, it just, it, it completely made me obsessed with mortgages and helping people get into homes and even, you know, single women or, um, you know, single, you know, single parents, it, uh, it's always a soft spot for me. So, so yes, yeah, so I feel really fortunate. I'm in this industry and um, I'm extremely passionate about it. That's, it's, it's interesting. You know, I was, I was talking with Laura, as you know, earlier and hearing her story and I didn't heard it before, but she, she also had like this really challenging um, teen pre 20 experience in her life that kind of propelled her into being driven. And when I think about my story, 
I was raised by a single mom who was incredibly driven and we were, we were pretty poor, you know, relative to America at one point. And I just remember like, there was a time in my life where I was like, man, I don't want to ever feel like this again. And, and that was, that was like a big part of my drive early in my career is I just didn't want to ever feel like that again. You called it instability. And, and I think that's a big driver for a lot of people, but at some point for you, and I'd love to hear you share, like it had to have turned because I know you're not unstable anymore. Like you're in a gray spot. You probably could have retired a long time ago. Like when did it go from that to purpose and where you really love like building a team and coaching lenders and realtors around the nation and helping clients and, you know, where you're like, I'm in this because I want to be here now, not because I have to be here now. That all changed when I, when I got into the core 10 years ago, when I surrounded myself with, you know, people like ourselves who were driven but then, yes, there is more to it. So my for the first you know five years, my whole goal was I need to really get some stability, build some wealth, you know, helping people, uh, helping my family. That was the most important thing. And then you know, like Rick tells us, our mentor, like you get to a certain point, then you need to start helping others. So that changed for me about five years ago. Where now, what's really important to me, of course, is you know helping my team grow, um, you know, helping. I've had, I have so many stories where I've had uh, receptionists that are now underwriters or team leads or, um, you know, loan officers. I really believe in bringing young people into the industry and showing a a career path similar to what I had uh, back in the day. So, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's really, really important to me. Yeah. It's super rewarding to see those stories. I'm sure you have a ton of them where you probably had a lot of people, you've helped them get out of debt. You've helped them buy their first house, um, you know, and and like you said, give them a career path. Um, One, one, you talk about Rick and what we do. You talked about helping others. When I, when I got into the core, I think I had been sober like eight or nine years, worked the 12 steps, been in AA, been sober 20 years now. And my life, even though I was sober, I was still living in chaos in my business and my life and my emotions. I was like, I just, I had a sponsor, but I didn't have like mentors to show me how to, what about the rest of my life? Like, what about spending money? What about, uh, workaholism and all these things? And so when I got to the core and I saw this very methodical process, and then, you know, I heard things like, Hey, once you get here, your job is to give it, give it away, be generous, help others. I was like, man, I always tell people like the core for me is like, AA for business people. It really, (laughs) it it really has been like that for me because it like guys like me, we just do really well with structure and a plan. If you show me a plan that works, I'll do it. And so uh, that it's funny that the way that you talk about it, that's, I've told Rick that before too. I say, and we even had a 12 step program, I think with level one, a couple of years ago. Oh, is that where that came from? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, um, so I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about we could go in so many different directions and I'm cool with talking about anything. Um, I like talking about social media with you. Um, in fact, I do want to just say something about that because you and I are going to be doing a class at the summit and we're talking about AI and all these different things. And I, what I love about you and people like you is that you weren't afraid to jump into something wholeheartedly, even if you didn't know how to do it. And I think one of the cool things about AI is it actually helps people that aren't techie learn how to do very techie things because it does a lot of the work for us. And so that's one of the, I think the funnest parts about technology and business, our industry or any other industry right now is there are so many ways for you to be able to do something like this, a podcast and edit it and, um, and start putting your brand out there. It's easier today than it's ever been. Yeah. I mean, AI is almost like a business coach too. Like, uh, I mean, you could put anything in there. Like what are the top three trending uh, topics that first time homebuyers want to know about? And that could help you right there. Figure out, you know, what to talk about on a reel or video. And, and sometimes I think we get, you know, in our head, we're thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to come up with something magical in social media, but we really don't. We just have to talk about you know, you have to figure out who you're talking to. And for me, I mean, for you it might be different, but for me, it's really that first time home buyer. 
that, and they don't need to hear a lot of different lingo that we talk on the side. They just need to know, like, you know, how, how do I get qualified? You know, what's a credit report? Like little things like that. But with, with with AI, I just love going in there and just, you know, breaking it down. That helps me have structure, right? Because just like you said, like, I just want to have the information or I want to be able to get that information. And, you know, for me and you, it's like, even though we do these videos, we're so busy, right? We have, we have to meet our clients. We have to, you know, meet our referral partners. We have to take care of our teams. So AI has actually, you know, really helped me shorten the time that I used, you know, in order to write reels or to figure out, you know, how I'm going to structure a, a project when it comes to social media. Yeah, that's, I, I do the same thing. I, I, there's, but there's so many things, right? I, I my tight, you know how on the loan estimate, it says title insurance optional. Yeah. Like the part, right. You ever have clients ask you, well, if that's optional, do I have to pay it? And you're like, um, and, and so <laughs> my, my team was asking me that the other day. Hey, someone asked me that again. I was like, I was like, Hey, go to Google Gemini. I said, go to Google Gemini and type in why is le- the lender's title policy considered optional on the loan estimate and then just say exactly what it says to you next time you get asked that question. And they did. That is so funny. And, yeah. I and mean, what, it was right. What's that? Did, did, was the answer correct? It was totally correct. It was perfect. And the, I've used it for math equations. Like, I mean, it's just so crazy. And I use Google Gemini a lot now. I mean, I like ChatGPT, but Google Gemini is just kind of like right there. And but there's just so okay. many things we can all use right now to, to leverage this. I know people are afraid of it, but I mean, I don't think we're going to make it go away. It doesn't seem like it anyways. So um, one of the other questions I was going to ask you, you know, right now we're in different markets, but there's a lot of similarities, right? So I read an article today that there's the the home buyer pause. So there's all these home buyers, as you and I both know, that are that have been on the fence for a long time. There's some that actually just can't afford to buy, but then there's a lot of people that can, and they're either trying to time the market, they're intimidated by rates, and they're just they're choosing not to right now. Um, what are some of the things that you're doing with those concerned buyers that are? Asking you if it's a good time, geez, Julie, like prices are still really high and rates are high too. You know, this is a pretty big part of my income. What would you do? What are some of the things you're telling people like that right now? If our, if my client can afford the payment, uh, the first thing I ask them is how long do you intend to live in this home if you bought this home today? So if they're telling me three years or less, then I'll probably say, then maybe you can wait. It's up to you. Right. But I remind them that real estate is a long-term investment and it's going to go like this and up and up and up, but it's still going to keep going up, but it's going to bounce around. Right. So I honestly tell them my story, which is, you know, today I have five properties, uh, you know, three rentals an Airbnb and a primary residence. And, you know, every one of those properties I bought in a market, except for one of them, that was a little bit scary. But my upside is so great because I've held on to those properties for a long time. So I kind of shift it to let's think long term because I think a lot of first time home buyers kind of like think it's like the stock market. I'm going to lose money today. I'm going to lose money tomorrow. Some don't look at that. Look at the long term gain and you can't go wrong. Plus, you have a roof over your head. You're, you know, you're bringing down your principal balance that could be tax benefits. I think a lot of people don't realize that or think about it. They think about it as the stock market, which I try and bring them back to reality. How about you? What do you do? Well, the first thing I just want to say is you're just doing the job you've always done and the job every lender and realtor should have always done. And it was a lot easier to do this job in 2020 when rates were 3%. Like, and I just think that that's the, that's the mentality shift is like, you know, it's not hard for someone to make a decision to buy a house when, they're less expensive and rates are two or 3%. And so, you know, we're kind of in a normal market right now where people really have to think through the long-term benefits and it's more of a financial plan. It's not, and I know this about you because we do the same thing that we're not just trying to help them buy a house. We're trying to help them figure out how to accumulate wealth. And if buying a house is a part of that plan and the timing is right, then they should probably do that, right? We don't know what the future holds, but there's all the benefits you get today. And if you're renting today, you're spending a lot of money. So I don't really do anything different than 
than what you're saying. I, I try to just educate them and demystify um, any wrong ideas they have. Um, you know, a lot of the things that I do, Julie, that I'm sure you do too, is I, I really tell them to do a personal family budget uh, because there's, there's a lot of buyers that they come in and they're like, I just want my payment to be X, but the house that they want is a payment of Y, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, how do we help them understand that, um, you know, let's figure out like what you really want. And I think if people aren't doing a personal family budget, then they don't really have an idea where they're coming up with that number. It's like an emotional number that they're pulling out of a hat. It's like, so until we actually understand where every dollar is going every month um, and where we're spending money, then we really don't have a clue of what our affordability is. And once we figure that out, then it just becomes a decision is like, is having this house with this payment more important than whatever it is that we're spending money on right now in our life. And, and I think that if people, if people can figure out that out, then it's kind of a simple answer for them. Funny that you say that because I literally just had a client, uh, I think it was Monday, it was Monday and they're paying $1,500 in rent and their landlord's telling them, Oh my gosh, you know, don't move your rent so low, blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling them, well, the landlord is definitely, you know, you're, you're helping them make their wealth, not you. And they could afford a payment of $4,000 easily, but $1,500 seems really low. So what I told them to do is, hey, for the next six months, make your $1,500 payment, but then put, you know, put $2,500 at the same time in a savings account. So you can see what it feels like to make that payment every month. And they were like, done, we're going to do that. So we're going to circle back in six months and see how that felt. And then I told them at the same time, you're saving a little bit of extra money. So they can afford it, but there's landlords out there. I don't know what's going on with this landlord, but $1,500 a month. I was going to say, I mean, you can't even get rent in Redding, California for that price, let alone Seattle. I, I, that's, that's crazy. It's not, it's not normal. I, and I'm, it's a very small, like, like, like 700 square foot, two bedroom, you know, townhome or something. So yeah, I just thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great plan. And, and I think a lot of our clients right now, it's, there's a lot more long-term buyers right now where they have this, they got to come up with a six month or a one year plan. Um, I had a client this uh, two weeks ago and she called me and they're having their third baby. They live in a two bedroom apartment. Um, it's like, I think it's like 1500 a month. No, it's, it's like 1800 a month for this apartment. And she's like, we can't stay here with three babies. We really need to buy a house. And she was like, Chris, I don't really want to buy a house or expensive, but for us to rent a house, it would be the same as a mortgage payment. Now this, this family, they've really done a good job. They saved 20%. They have no debt. I mean, they've managed their money better than a lot of people. But I mean, I think it's one of the things I'm seeing with a lot of people is they're starting to realize like, we really don't have a choice when you really start thinking about it and looking at how much money you're spending on rent. The fact that prices keep going up, even with higher rates, you know, people, I think consumers are starting to catch on now that, you know, these prices may not go down. And when rates go down, instead of that being an opportunity that could actually cost us more. Right. And through, you know, the decades, this hasn't changed. Like you can go to YouTube and find like the news where somebody's interviewing somebody in 1985 and saying, Oh my gosh, the prices are so high. Like this has been around forever and we just have to realize. And I think the media also just is a big part of this because the media is in everybody's heads and of course, because, you know, bad news sells, right? So I think that people just need to like really think about their situation and then they really have to think long-term when they're thinking about buying a home. Yep. They definitely do. So I was going to ask you a little bit about, so let's talk about families who can't afford to, to buy right now. One of the things that you and I do is a personal family budget. It's changed our life. I know that you didn't, you, 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 you're self-made. You didn't, you know, you, you came from a hard, you know, a hard upbringing where you kind of had to create where you're at today. What would be some advice that you would give young families right now that are struggling with inflation and they would love to buy a house, but they're going to hear this and go, man, we're pretty far off from that. What would be some of the steps you would tell them to do? Right. 
if somebody really wants to buy a home, um, you know, I mean, you could say, you know, save money or, you know, you could also talk about impulse shopping, you know, Instagram got me again or Facebook got me again. But it's so easy to buy things online when you have your phone. It's crazy. But, but if you could also think about trying to make more money, I think that would be, you know, a better upside and, and a shorter term rather than saving money. But I think you should do both. So saving a little bit of money here, or there, figuring out where you can cut costs. There's lots of great apps that can help you do that by going through your bank statements and figure out where all your money is going and categorizing it. But then also think about, Hey, can I, can I work, you know, you know, a few hours, you know, extra every day, or maybe on weekends, you know, doing something else that will earn me more money or in my current employment, like, is there another possibility that I could actually make more money? Should I ask for a raise? I mean, we should all be doing this really, you know, even, even us. So we should be trying to make more money. We should trying to be cutting down, you know, expenses, but that's what I would say. I would say there's not one or the other. You should do both. I totally agree. I, I, I've been trying to help some of my clients with negotiation skills and I just, I'll tell them, you know, cause if, if we're in a spot where they need more, clearly they need more income and I couldn't agree more, like a personal family budget is only going to take you so far. Like at, at the end of the day, you got to make more money. And so I've, I've told a lot of these, these young families, I'm like, Hey, you seem like a really solid person and I'm just going to let you in on a little secret in California. It is really hard to find and keep good people. If you've been there for three years and you're one of the hardest workers and you always show up to work, if you go up to your boss and you say, my wife and I are wanting to buy a home because rent's expensive so that we can start a family, but we're not making enough right now. Is there anything that I can do to help become more valuable to you so that I can make more money because we really need to buy a house? there's a very good chance knowing how employers are that you are going to get a raise immediately because they do not want to lose someone like you. Oh my, you hit that right on the nose. I, I mean, if somebody came up to me and I, I don't know, my team's listening, but yes, we, we can wh we'll whisper. <laughs> we'll whisper. No, I'm a firm believer in giving raises and all that, but yes, I mean, that is brilliant. Just like, ask your employer, talk to them about how you want to buy a home. And, you know, like you said, every good employer is going to want to keep them here, right? It's just, it's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and you said a couple other things, I mean, certifications, additional licenses, um, and worst case scenario, call the competitor, see if they'll pay you more. Uh, you know, it's because our media is kind of telling the story that the economy is horrible and, you know, there's no jobs and all these different things, but my experience is it's never been easier for someone to figure out how to make more money right now. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. You, you, you also need to work on yourself and become more valuable. I always tell people like, you know, the best thing that will help you in your career is personal development. So learning how to communicate better, how to write better, you know, just, uh, you know, anything that's going to give you more drive or more discipline, all those things will help you. But yes, that's, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I think you and I, we're, we're very competitive and we're still trying to get better, right? We're still trying to grow our worth and, you know, maybe in the future, you know, I'll be looking elsewhere. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to touch on that. For, so personal development, I mean, I know you and I know the people we run with, like that's obviously very important and you can't really work effectively for the hours that sometimes our careers or any career that's worth doing demands and expect to get home and have energy for your spouse and your kids. What are some of the other tips that you would tell people that they could do to develop themselves personally that will translate to making more money and kind of going in the direction that we're talking about? Yeah. I think the number one thing you can do is to get fit. Like if you are fit, it's almost like you become this different person where nothing can stop you. It builds confidence and it just, it's a catapult you. So, so if there's the first thing to do is get fit, I'm not saying that you have to be a bodybuilder, but you just have to get fit. Um, and also health wise so that you can work longer if you need to, so that you have enough energy for your family. 
Um, like on my Instagram page, it says obsess. Number one is I'm obsessed with my family then mortgages and fitness. That's how I see it. Just like fitness is very, very, you need to be obsessed with being fit and living longer, longevity and all that. And then the second thing I would do is depending upon your field, uh, in any field, communication is the best thing that you can do to catapult you. In fact, I've seen, you know, you can be an, an amazing engineer who can figure out everything, but if you can't actually talk to your team and, you know, and articulate what you really want and show empathy and have emotional intelligence, all those things, you're just going to do that, that same job and you're not going to catapult yourself. So I would say fitness and then communication skills in any field, those two will work. And it's important in your marriage too. Communication, oh, right? Oh, yes. For, for fitness and communication. Yes. <laughs> both. Okay. We'll say both. Yes. Stamina. Um, <laughs> well, the, so my wife and I, um, we, we've been married 14 years and we had some real communication challenges just like everybody else. And so my, I'm very fortunate that I have, I have some incredible friends that are brilliant at emotional health and marriage counseling and stuff. And so one of my best friends referred me to this guy in Tennessee and they have this, they have this thing called connection codes. And so what they teach you is how to connect with your spouse using, um, the, um, the core emotion wheel, joy, um, you know, anger, str uh, frustrated. I, I don't remember them all right now. Clearly I don't remember them all, but we, every night we go through it. So I'll go through it as joy, shame and guilt, um, angry, um, sad, hurt. And so at the end of the night, you have to go, th just go through your day and just say, I, I felt this today. And if you didn't feel all of them, that's fine. But I was really angry when this happened. I was sad when I heard this news, I was really joyful at breakfast with the kids and what happens is you really connect with your spouse on an emotional level. And the rules to this process is you cannot say anything. You cannot try to fix it. You can't try to solve it. The only thing you can do is say, hmm, or, oh, I understand that. And then when they're done, the only thing you can say is, how can I help you? Or what do you need from me? And at first it feels really clunky. And then in the end, you're like, whoa, man, it was never that she needed to know about my whole day. She just needed to know how I felt and what I experienced. And the emotions is the most important part. And what's incredible about that is when you start thinking about that in business and relationships with referral partners or any person that feeling emotions, I'll never forget. I had someone call me who was really stressed out and they had a perception that it was my fault. And because I had gone through this exercise, the first thing I said was, tell me more. Mm, I understand. I get it. And in the end, instead of saying, well, if you wouldn't have done this, it wouldn't have put us in this situation. I said, tell me what I can do to help. And they said, I don't really need anything, man. I just wanted to let you know. And thank you so much for listening. And I hung up the phone. I, when I told my team, I said, guys, I'm going to tell you something I just learned. I said, we never have to defend ourselves again. We just have to be there with people through their feelings. So it's so crazy, man. I think communication is literally the most important thing for me to learn at this stage of my life. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, uh, and it hasn't always been that way for me, but the last 10 years, yes. And I'm, I'm still growing and trying to learn, but that's amazing. Is that a book or is that? They like have that? a book. Yeah. I highly recommend it. It's Dr. Glenn Hill and his wife, Phyllis. They're unbelievable. Uh, what they're, he's a. Uh, he, coaching for that too. I think somebody told me about that. Yep. He coaching does. He does one-on-one coaching. -on -one coaching. He does retreats. He's it's, it's some of the most powerful stuff I've ever found for, for your marriage, for your children, for any human being to learn how to connect with them because uh, so much of what's going on is nonverbal. And I think that, you know, wives always get mad at men because they tell us what they're feeling and we try to fix it. Cause that's all we know. And I finally know that it's not about fixing it. It's about 
being there with someone through their feelings and listening to them. And so it's very, very interesting and it, it applies to business too. So I would agree with you full circle for people that are wanting to go somewhere in their career, in their marriage, communication is everything because it allows us to learn how to control our emotions and listen to people and not react out of fear, um, be vulnerable. And, and that stuff's something that's becoming more popular with a lot of high net worth people right now. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, just to be able to, you know, um, I do like a 15 minute training with my team, all our staff people, we all get on together uh, every Wednesday. And it's just called, you know, it's called training with Julie, but basically it's just, it's not necessarily about work. It's about, you know, communication and stuff like that. One of the things that we talk about is, you know, how do you deal with a, a client that's upset? And, um, and just like you said, it's, you know, behind, you know, anger is fear and they're afraid. So you have to listen to what they're saying and then you have to, you know, empathize with them and, um, and behind, you know, anger is fear. And I think, you know, when we're, when we're talking, when we're thinking about our clients and referral partners and our family, just like you said, like, that is just so crucial. And I'm still learning, like, you know, I, I, my mouth will run and then all of a sudden, I'll, oh, what did I just say? Right. So I'm, I'm definitely um, somebody who's trying to grow into communicating better too, but I'm definitely getting that book. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be so interested to see what you think. It's incredible. So the last thing I thought I'd, we would talk about Julie is, is leadership and, you know, you, you lead a big team, you, you lead, you know, multiple branches from what I know of you and people in different locations. You're, you're a coach and, and you're an incredible leader. And, um, and I think that that word is intimidating to people and they don't actually knows what it, what, what it means. You know, one of the things I learned a long time ago was, um, everything is a learned skill, right? So it's not like we're born a phenomenal leader. I don't know about you, but a lot of becoming a leader has come out of like people quitting on me <laughs> and, and, and hard times where I totally blew it and got emotional and, you know, wigged out on somebody. And so it's come through a lot of pain for me, honestly. And so I would just love to hear some tactics on leadership because I know that there's people that listen to this that are business leaders, team leaders, and that are in that struggle every day. And I think you're someone who, who really demonstrates this at a high level. And I would just love to hear some, some leadership tactics that you're practicing today and, and maybe some of the struggles you had along the way. Oh yeah. There are a lot of struggles. I promise you, um, you know, no one, there's not really a class of leadership. Well, maybe you can find one today, but John Maxwell has you books know. on it. I think. I know. I know. Yeah. But you know, I mean, it's really interesting because you know, I've had it over the years, multiple employees. I've lost many employees. It's, it's always going to be part of our journey. Like you can't just hang on to everybody forever. Right. And you have to like think. So I think I'm a better leader than I was, you know, five years ago because of all the things that I've learned. And every time I've lost an employee, I've lost a team member, you know, I think of it like, it's my fault. You know, I learned that from our mentor, Rick. It's like, it's my fault. And what I love about saying it's my fault is number one, I can fix it. Maybe I can fix it or I can learn from it. And so if somebody leaves me. The first thing I said is, you know, what could I have done differently? And I don't try and say, well, they're like this, this and that. I just don't think about that anymore. And I just think, what could I have done differently? And then I learn from that. And, you know, it's, it's always going to be part of your journey when you're an employer, you're going to have people, there's turnover, but what I do different today than I used to do is, you know, when somebody left me, it would be like, oh, I'm done. You're out of my life forever. I'm never going to talk to you again. Where if somebody's telling me they're leaving today, it's like, I'm so happy for you that you have this opportunity. You're amazing. I'm always here for you, here for you, no matter what. So, you know, you can always come back you know, that that's, I leave an open door and I never, never burn a bridge ever. And, and then some of these people I still talk to, you know, because you never know what happens because they might come back in the future. If there's somebody that you think that would, would be good to be on your team in the future. Then, you know, I just look at it more as, you know, I try not to take it to the heart so much, although it does hurt. It will always hurt, but it used to hurt for days and days and days. And now it doesn't hurt that many, that, that for that many days anymore. 
So that's pretty much what I've learned in having a great, great team. team yeah. Members. I love, I love the whole, it's my fault thing, right? Because uh, again, something I learned in AA, they, they said our problems are of our own making and it, there's no solution in blaming other people. Right. So it's like, if, if even if it was 99%, that person's fault, whatever happened, the only way I'm going to grow is if I can find the 1% that is mine. Now, most of the time it's 90% my fault. Right. But it's like, that mentality of always trying to keep your side of the street clean is definitely a trait that I see in leaders that I want to follow, you know, um, because they're always wanting, they're humble, you know, they know they don't know everything and they know that they have a lot to learn, to learn a loan officer I interviewed not too long ago who I've known for a long time. I've always admired this gal and hoped that we would work together. She, at some point over the last couple of years, she had made a comment to me that, you know, so-and-so said so-and-so about you, it was negative. And this gal worked for me eight or nine years ago. And I remember looking at her and saying, yep, that's true. I did do that. And I, I wish I wouldn't have, but honestly, you know, that was a mistake I made and I had to learn is, you know, but I'm, but I'm in process, you know, and it's like part of who I am today is because of those experiences. And, and I just, I have so much respect for people that lead teams and organizations, especially in states like California, because it's really, really hard and it is not the easier, softer way in life, but it can be really rewarding. And the last thing I'll say about that, you know, one of the things Rick talks to us about is discipleship and, and that word can mean a lot of things to different people, but I know this is true for you and, and it's true for me too. It really my team and especially over the last few years where I had to like pay out of pocket to keep them employed at times. Um, I had to start seeing them as my family and I, I had to realize like they're with me more than they are with their own kids and their own spouses. And during the crazy times of my industry, they're working extra hours. And I realized how sad would that be if whenever they departure from being connected to me, their life is not better. Their bank accounts are not better. Their debt is less. Their wealth is greater. Like I, that really, that really rocked me, Julie, when I thought oh through God. that. An amazing statement of, you know, they're my family and you can even take it another step where you're saying they're my, you know, they're like my child, my, you know, what do you want for your kids? You want great education. You want them to make money you want them to be happy and so when you think about it as you know family member or kid that really really like brings it down to a level where you can really understand it more of what it's like to be a leader because i think if you treat them like your family or a child or one of your you know siblings or children's everything can change right and and even if they leave you or if they like if your kid leaves out of state if you're if your employee goes somewhere else you always want the best for them no matter what easier said than done, right? Because we're hurting, but yeah. Yeah. Well, Julie, thank you again for making time. I'm going to definitely put some links in the description, you know, for lenders and realtors that happen to listen to this podcast. Uh, we're a part of the core and we have a, you know, we have a lot of events coming up that we would love to see you at. Um, you know, there's not very many places in the real estate and lending industry, especially in 2024, where you can sit around the table with literally multimillionaires who are doing big numbers in a market like this by relationship, not buying leads. And then for anybody else, uh, you know, someone who's thinking about buying, wanting to know more about investing, you know, feel free to check out some of the other links. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave comments. So Julie, thank you so much again. And I hope you have an awesome weekend. Thank you, Chris. This has been so much fun. Appreciate you. You too.